Okay, Congressman, we're live. Well, Emily, thank you very much and good evening uh, to our Cornell community in the United States and, and around the world. Thank you for joining us for a, a really important conversation about voting rights and the status of litigation and legislation pertaining to the right of Americans to go to the polls and cast their votes, a fundamental uh, element of democracy. We have a very special guest uh, this evening who's going to be introduced properly. Uh, I do want to um, acknowledge uh, the presence of uh, some other very special guests. We're joined this evening by former Congressman Martin Frost, a Democrat from Texas, former Democratic Senator uh, from North Dakota, Heidi Heitkamp uh, is with us, the former Lieutenant Governor of the State of New York and the Chairman of the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at Cornell, Dick Ravitch uh, is with us, uh, as well as James Irish, uh, who um, is a leader in the Cornell Alumni Organization in Westchester County uh, in New York. For those of you who are not familiar with the Institute, uh, we have a very simple mission and that is to, see, to deepen discourse and raise understanding. Our rule is no sound bites. We really want uh, both sides of the aisle and everybody in between to truly understand the complexities uh, of the challenges that we face in a polite and civil conversation. And that's what we bring to you this evening. Our past guests have included President Bill Clinton, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, President Trump's Chief of Staff, Reince Priebus, uh, and literally dozens of members of the House and the Senate, pundits, journalists, diplomats, and others. We invite you to uh, check us out at, uh, well, actually the best way of doing it is simply to Google Cornell Institute of Politics, uh, and uh, you can register for future uh, events. Uh, coming up uh, over the next couple of weeks, so we have some um, really insightful programs on November 17th at 7 p.m. Join us for a tale of an Afghan interpreter. Uh, we'll be having a conversation with Farid Ferdos. Uh, he was a member, he was a, grew up in Afghanistan, was recruited by the United States Army, uh, secured a bronze medal, uh, and um, left Afghanistan, uh, actually became a student at Cornell University. His family was left behind when the United States withdrew from Afghanistan. His family was there. He's going to talk about his experiences uh, that's November 17th at 7. December 1st at 6 p.m. is bipartisanship possible, a conversation with two former members of Congress, uh, former Republican member of Congress, Peter King and, and myself. And then December 8th at 7 p.m., former Speaker Newt Gingrich will be in conversation, a historic perspective uh, on uh, Speaker Gingr Gingrich's time in Washington. That's going to be led by our Associate Executive Director, Aaron King Sweeney. As always, to register for programs, uh, just to visit Cornell uh, Institute of Politics, uh, and we'll take care of you. Uh, this evening, Mark Elias, uh, founder of Democracy Docket and partner of Elias Law Group, and Peter Joseph, uh, chairman of Trenton Renewable Power LLC. I'm going to introduce Peter in a moment. We're going to have a conversation with Mark. It will take us to about 735, at which point we'll invite questions from our audience. We have about 600 people registered for this evening. Emily Anderson will tell you exactly how to pose your question either in the chat room or to be recognized live. That will happen at about 7.35. For now, I want to introduce uh, our host of this evening's program, Peter Joseph. He's the chairman of Trenton Biogas LLC. It's a company uh, that developed the first independent commercial scale food waste recycling facility in the New York metropolitan area. He was uh, in the institutional private equity uh, investment business for over 25 years. Uh, he combines his investment activities with a significant commitment of time and resources to areas of public policy, member of the board of the New York City Citizens Budget Committee, commissioned for more than 20 years, third way, uh, also served as a member of the U.S. Department of State's Advisory Committee on International Economic Policy. But most important of all, uh, he is a very strong supporter of the Cornell University Institute of Politics and Global Affairs and a Cornellian himself. He graduated, he holds an AB degree in European history from Cornell and a JD degree from Columbia University School of Law. Peter Joseph, thank you for your support of our programs. And I'm going to yield to you to properly introduce Mark and we'll begin our conversation. Oh, Peter, you're on mute. There you go. I think I got, now I've unmuted myself. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, as all of you have heard, we're in for a very, very important conversation, perhaps the most important conversation facing us currently as a country. And I'm so pleased that the Cornell Institute of Politics and Global Policy is bringing 
to all of us this discussion this evening. If I may, I'd like to just take a few minutes to thank the Cornell community and particularly the Institute of Politics for, for providing this wonderful opportunity for the Joseph family to honor our father and grandfather. Mark Joseph was a graduate of the Cornell Law School class of 1950. He considered both his connection to Cornell and his commitment to the practice of law to be defining elements of his life. Child of immigrants, my father never forgot the role that Cornell played in according him the opportunity to reach beyond his depression era upbringing. A lifelong liberal in the best sense of the word, his life was molded by his experience of the New Deal, the Great Society, and the Civil Rights Movement among other social moments of the 20th century. And therefore this series of social dialogues would have great, great meaning to him. He would frankly pinch himself at getting the recognition of participating in this evening's event. And so on behalf of the Mark Joseph family, including a son and grandson who are Cornelians, two of three of his children are lawyers, three of five of his grandchildren are lawyers, and all are engaged in some form of social action from studying migration law in Amsterdam to becoming an emerging leader of grassroots activism environment for in advancing environmental justice. We once again thank Cornell for providing such a meaningful way for us to celebrate our father's memory and legacy. And with that, I'd now like to turn to the business at hand. Uh, everyone is going to hear shortly from, uh, from Mark about his story, so I don't want to linger too long on that. But uh, as most of you know, he's a nationally recognized authority in voting rights, redistricting, campaign finance, law and litigation. As Steve mentioned, he's the founder of Democracy Docket, a leading progressive media platform dedicated to voting rights and democracy and the Elias Law Group, a mission-driven firm committed to helping Democrats win citizens vote and progressive make, make, uh, progressives making change. Uh, he's got a long, long docket of cases, uh, four of which are before the US, have been before the US Supreme Court involving politics, voting rights and redistricting. I really don't wanna take more time in this long introduction because I'd rather have everybody here for Mark directly. So if I may, uh, I'll just finish by uh, telling everybody Mark uh, uh, grew up and uh, uh, is from the metropolitan area on Long Island, not in Steve's district, but nevertheless, an alumnus of the Duke Law School. And I'm told here an important part of his bio is that he's the proud owner of a Portuguese water dog named Bodhi. Uh, so with that, I turn the floor to Mark Elias. Mark, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you, Congressman. It's good to see uh, you and thank everyone for, 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 uh, for joining tonight. Mark, let me, uh, let me hop in with the first question, if I may, so we can create some context and then we can just uh, build, up, build on that. Um, first of all, I, I just want to echo what Peter said and thank you for joining us. You and I worked very closely together when I chaired the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee. Um, I, uh, for the, in our green room, I'm literally in a green room, a catering facility, <laughs> and I, because my wife is uh, being honored, and I want to be able to do this and also hear her speech, but when I walked into this room to get on with Mark, I pointed out that seeing him uh, just sent shivers down my spine, because he and I were in the trenches uh, in some pretty tough battles, and sometimes the battles weren't necessarily Democrats versus Republicans, sometimes the battles were Democrats versus Democrats. But Mark, um, look, so many people know of, of, of your, your work, your, your leadership, but I'm not sure many really have a sense of your trajectory, what put you in this place. So if you can just share some details of your journey uh, and how you ended up where you are. Yeah, so a lot of luck. You know, I grew up um, in um, 
uh, in Valley Stream, Long Island, which for those of you who don't know about Long Island, what you need to know is that the further east and north you go, the richer it is and the nicer it is. And Valley Stream is literally the southwestern corner of Long Island, uh, bordering, uh, bordering Queens. Uh, I couldn't quite see Queens from where I lived, but I could walk to Queens uh, from, from where I lived. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was, my parents were New Deal Democrats. Um, I once was at an event uh, uh, at the National Democratic Party where they went around the room and asked everyone, why are you a Democrat? And I sort of sort of scratched my head and said, well, I was born a Democrat. I don't know. Um, uh, uh, also, you know, the family of, of Jewish immigrants um, uh, to this country uh, and uh, democracy was at the centerpiece of what America offered my grandparents and then my parents and my brother and I. Um, Interesting the thing about Cornell is like all good Jewish public school students, my first choice in college was to go to Cornell, right? Because that's where everyone wanted to go. Uh, uh, I went to Hamilton College, which was a small uh, liberal arts college in central New York. Um, uh, and uh, then for law school, I thought about going to Cornell for law school, but having spent enough time in central New York and upstate New York in the winter, I decided that Though I'd never been to North Carolina, it sounded quite a bit uh, warmer. So that's uh, that. That was my journey out of uh, uh, out of New York and into uh, law school. Uh, and then I came to Washington D.C. in 1993, um, having just graduated from law school, uh, just in time for Democrats to lose control of the House for the first time in 40 years. And I knew I wanted to be involved in politics. I knew I wanted to be involved in uh, in moving forward progressive values then at that point uh peter liberal values uh, i was a liberal democrat back then now i guess i'm a progressive democrat uh uh and um uh and democrats lost control of the house uh, for this the first is, time this is 1994 years. mark this was 1994. Okay. new gingrich uh came in as the new speaker and mm -hmm. um dick Gephardt was the was the democratic leader um and uh, uh david bonnier was the whip and they decided that they needed to do to Newt Gingrich what Newt Gingrich had done to the prior Democratic speaker and leader. You probably recall Speaker Foley and the House Bank scandal. Um, uh, and so I got connected up with the DCCC and Martin Frost was the chair uh, uh, and was my, my, first, my first sort of boss of sorts was Matt Engel and, and Martin uh, Frost where I basically spent every day trying to figure out how to torture Newt Gingrich and Tom DeLay. That then spread um, into a, a career that then jumped from the, from the House uh, and to the Senate when Senator Torricelli of New Jersey became, who was a Congressman from New Jersey, became the, the DSCC chair. Um, from there, I met John Kerry, became the the general counsel to his presidential candidate campaign, um, met uh, then candidate Obama um, in, uh, in Illinois. I had uh, drinks with him and he said, uh, if I had the money, I could win. And I said, if I had the money, I could win. The problem is neither of us have the money and you're running against a near billionaire. Um, uh, uh, I, he was right, I was wrong. Uh, and he wound up you know, becoming a Senator and then I was going to the White House. And so I just kind of like moved along from one thing to the next in politics, but along the way, I never lost sight of what it is we were fighting for. And we were fighting for economic justice. We were fighting for um, racial justice. We were fighting for um, uh, expanding democracy. And you know, when I worked with you, Steve, when you were chair of the DCCC, those were the fights we were having. We were having those fights before Donald Trump. We were, we were trying to make sure that voters could vote. We were trying to make sure there were fair districts around the country. Some of the fights, the intra-democratic fights we you refer to were those. We were trying to make sure that 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 the arc of the moral universe was bending towards justice. And um, that's how I wound up uh, where I was when I when I uh, was working with you. And unfortunately, in the uh, era of Donald Trump uh, and the Republican Party, it's taken me more in that direction. Peter. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Mark, could you speak to the question of why voting rights has become such a partisan issue? The Institute is bipartisan, nonpartisan. So I want to make sure we 
talk a little bit about principles here, a little bit other than some of the political war stories, which we all enjoy for sure. But it seems as if this issue, which is, should be like apple pie and motherhood, and maybe this is a naive question because after all, elections are all about the results of elections. But why is this conversation so, so charged and so, so toxically partisan for what it seems to me should be a rather straightforward issue? Yeah, so it's a really important question because um, it has not always been this way. Um, from 1965 to 2009, uh, voting rights was basically nonpartisan. That doesn't mean the two sides didn't disagree over some things involving voting rules, but the trend across the board was towards more progressive voting rules. So, you know, it was during that time that you saw states adopt no excuse absentee voting. You saw states experiment with uh, vote by mail. You saw states uh, experiment with early voting and adopt early voting. And by states, I don't mean blue states. I mean, Ohio was one of the first states to really move towards more early voting. Florida adopted early voting and vote by mail. Um, it was really, and, and by the way, uh, universal vote by mail in states like uh, Oregon and Washington were, were under Republican as well as Democratic elected officials. Most of the impetus around election administration was how do we satisfy constituents, right? Because as the congressman can tell you, you know, constituents get upset about potholes, they get upset about all kinds of things. So if there's a way to make election day work smoother, it was just a constituent service. Um, and the second was actually about saving money, right? You had all of these municipalities that had bought all of this voting equipment that could only be used one day a year for you know, every other year or every year in some places. Um, and how could they, they implement um, more um, effective use of their, their funds? And that was the trend, which is why you saw in, in many places in the South, where, which were run by the Republicans, you saw the expansion of voting rights alongside with places that were controlled by Democrats. In fact, some of the most restrictive voting rules were in New England, which were, which were not necessarily controlled by Republicans. So it was nonpartisan or it was bipartisan. What happened next was the following. In 2009, President Obama redefined the map for both parties. And all of a sudden you saw black voters, young voters, first time voters um, uh, uh, really unite into what was then the Obama coalition. And it became much clearer what rules were going to benefit first time voters and minority voters versus uh, older voters, voters who had voted more often and non-minority voters. So it became easier to target those things um, as the electorate became more, uh, each party became more homogeneous and less, he less heterogeneous in terms of voting preferences. So you started to see the beginnings of it being partisan, but there was still a, an important piece of the equation that was present that kept it from being completely partisan. And that is shame. Shame is an important factor in politics, I have learned representing lots of politicians. There is a certain dignity that, that elected officials have in doing the right thing, whether they're doing it because they think it's the right thing or they want to be perceived. If you go back and read Profiles in Courage, John Kennedy talks about courage. And one of the things he talks about political courage is that in order to have political courage, the politician needs to have an ego. They need to have self-respect because political courage comes out in part from the idea of how elected officials want to be perceived. And that was true around voting. There was a celebration of democracy that was bipartisan. What happened next, we all know, which is that with the election of Donald Trump, shame was drained out of the Republican Party. And I'm sorry to say that in a partisan fa fa fashion, but the, that's just the facts. And the Republican Party became the party of opposing voting rights. And so they married what was already a growing political interest in restricting voting rights because it would advantage them at the polls with the fact that Donald Trump made opposition to voting and opposition to free and fair elections central to who he was. And as the Republican Party has become more and more captivated by pleasing Donald Trump and his supporters and showing fealty to him, it has put that party in a box where they have no choice for their own self-interest and for their self-interest of their party 
to oppose voting rights at every turn. So that's my sense of how we got where we are. Mark, if you could share with uh, our viewers the kinds of cases that you're pursuing, the high profile ones, um, so that they have a, a good sense of exactly what you're doing and what some of the challenges are. Yeah, so I would put the, I'd put the litigation that I'm involved in right now, just to put it in perspective, <clears throat> uh, my team and I are litigating um, 31 cases in 18 states. So when we talk about there being widespread voter uh, voting, voter suppression, uh, 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 election administration issues and redistricting, it's pretty widespread. And Congressman, as you know, we are only in the third inning on redistricting. You know, so so you know we will see those numbers grow and the number of states grow. But I would say that in the voting context, the cases fall into two categories. Number one, there have been there have been a series of states that have passed omnibus voting laws after the big lie, after the insurrection on January 6th, simply to show fealty to, to the cause. Those are Texas, Florida, Georgia, Kansas, Montana, Arkansas, and Iowa. Now I list all seven states because if you watch the news, you would think it's just you know some swing states, Georgia or Florida, and it's Texas because it's tech because that's the way Texas is. But what's really interesting is the first state to pass a, an omnibus voter suppression law was Iowa. And in Iowa, they made it harder to register, harder to vote by mail, harder to vote um, early, and they shortened election day by an hour. I mean, think about that. What legislature shortens election day by an hour? But they literally took an, clipped an hour off of the end of election day. And when you look at a state like Iowa, where Republicans swept electorally, and the trend has been pretty good for them there. Um, you understand that this is not just a red state, blue state. There's not just a, a like swing state issue. This is a national issue. So we're litigating in all seven of those states. Um, the second category are, are cases that involve one-off statutes that seem particularly targeted at harming particular groups of voters. So for example, we recently concluded a piece of litigation in New Hampshire that was aimed at basically student registrations, right? Preventing students from being able to register and vote. Uh, in New Hampshire. Uh, the third category is redistricting, which you, which you know very well, which Congressman Frost, who I hear is in the audience, knows very, very well. And we're in a redistricting cycle. And therefore, we know that where there is redistricting, there will be litigation. Um, this time, it's a little different than in the past, both because there are fewer tools. The Supreme Court struck down show, uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act after the last round of redistricting. But also, and this is really critical, and this goes to that shame point I make, it used to be that politicians wanted to say, we passed the maps because they were fair maps. And what's interesting is how many legislatures, so far Republican legislatures, are saying, no, 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 we passed partisan maps. We were partisan gerrymandering. We weren't racially gerrymandering. We were partisan gerrymandering. And the admission that that's what they're doing, I mean, we've known for some time that's what they were doing. But the boldness by which they, they brag that that's what they're doing is part of what makes the challenge of 2021 so much different. Peter? How does this all make you feel about the federalist system at the end of the day? I heard that the Supreme Court heard a case on gun control and some of the commentators were suggesting that it's more than likely that New York State is going to have its gun control law regulating carriage of handguns within New York State thrown out as being violent of the Second Amendment. Why doesn't the 13th Amendment play the same role that the Second Amendment seems to be protecting gun control? You know, it's it's a great question, Peter. And I, I just to put my, just to date myself, um, I went to law school at Duke University um, between 1990 and 1993. Okay, so very beginning of the 1990s. And the reason why I mentioned the time period and the school is that that was the university that Ken Starr had graduated from. And at that point he was a rising, uh, this is pre-independent uh, counsel, he was a rising conservative um, judge, looked like he was going to the US Supreme Court. So Duke had a very strong relationship with what was at that point kind of the early days of the Federalist Society. And I remember going to Federalist Society events because they would bring speakers to the law school. And, and in fact, 
in my in during my career, you know, as recently as a decade ago, I spoke at Federal Society events. And there was a sense that what that what the Federal Society at that point was trying to do is to build a lasting ideological take on the courts. And it was exactly what you were suggesting. It was a federalist take, which was the, that courts should wade into fewer issues and they should leave more issues to states. Okay, that was, that was in a nutshell. There was originalism part of it, but the originalism was really a, a, a strong de devolution of power to the states. The idea being that, you know, at the time the constitution was written, states were really the primary regulators of activity and, and the federal court should take a step back from, from intervening. It is unrecognizable today what they have become. And there isn't any rash, rhyme or reason anymore. I mean, there's no rhyme or reason to why now certain rights are involative and others are e easily forfeited. And it makes no, I mean, the, the, the Supreme Court, it may reverse this, but the Supreme Court denied a stay on a law in Texas involving abortion that, that empowered um, ordinary um, citizens to sue women who had abortions. And the way they claimed to get around Roe re versus Wade is it wasn't the state. Could you imagine if New York had passed a law that said you get ten thousand dollars if you sue someone because they own a handgun? Do you imagine that if that went to the U.S. Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court would have said, "Ah, we're not going to stay it while we hear the case"? I mean, it has become transparently outcome determinative in many of the courtrooms in America, which makes it harder to litigate. We have to keep doing it, and we have to try to win with the theories that we have. But um, it is it is deeply concerning that democracy is not being protected in any form of absolutist way. And I'll, I'll say one last thing. If you go back and you look at the cases from the early 1960s on voting, they are in absolutist terms. Texas was prohibiting voting by members of the military who were stationed in Texas. The Supreme Court didn't balance that. They just said, no, you can't do that. The Supreme Court didn't balance the rights of voters against, against state interests in, when it was striking down uh, the various restrictions on voting in the 1960s and 1970s. That's really an invention of the last couple of decades. And it's wrong as a matter of jurisprudence. And it's very much a, a reflection on a lack of commitment to democracy as a core principle. Steve, I'm gonna ask you Thank, thank you. I just had a little, a little technical glitch. Um, Mark, you referenced uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. I have a very vivid recollection of sitting in a leadership meeting with um, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer and Jim Clyburn uh, when the Supreme Court made that decision uh, with respect to Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. And I also recall going to the floor, floor of the House after that and hearing from the Republican leaders of the Judiciary Committee that that decision was wrong and it would be corrected, that this was one thing that Republicans and Democrats could agree on, and yet it was never corrected. Can, can you talk about the, the, the gravity of, of that decision with respect to Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act and, and what the consequences have been? Yeah, and it's, and it's, it's one of two or three opinions that really turned, my, turned me much more radical around what's going on around democracy in Congress and what's going on with democracy before the courts. Because let's be clear, the, the Congress of the United States made a decision in 1965 based on its authority, its express authority on, in the 14th Amendment, which grants Congress expressly the authority to implement the, the, um, the, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments. It gives Congress that authority. In fact, I would argue, and I did argue before the Supreme Court, that that's plenary authority. It's not even reviewable. Congress can do whatever they want to expand voting rights. And there's no balancing at all that goes into place. But in any event, Congress made a judgment that we needed a standard called retrogression to, to make sure that states with a history of voting discrimination Okay, states with a history of voting discrimination cannot change the voting rules in ways that make them worse for minority voters. Okay, that's what the that's what Section Five of the Voting Rights Act says. Can't make it worse for for minority voters. If you have a history of discriminating in voting, you can't you can't pass laws to make it worse. And to make sure you don't sneak these bias before they go into effect, they have to be reviewed by the Department of Justice. Or if you don't like the Department of Justice, they have to be reviewed by um, uh, a federal court in Washington D.C. and Justices, conservative justices on the U.S. Supreme Court looked at that and said, you know, we think times have changed. 
We think the South has changed. Well, first of all, it's really none of their business. Congress made a judgment in 1965, which it then reauthorized in 1982 and in 2006. In 2006, Congress reaffirmed that judgment and said, we still think this is necessary. But the Supreme Court disagreed and said, it, it's not so. Uh, we don't think it's necessary. We think the times have changed and the South has changed. There's no judicial conservatism in that decision. There's no respect for coordinate branches of government. All the things that the Federal Society said they stood for, they abandoned there. So that happened, and that was deeply disappointing. But as you say, we assumed that this would be a short time uh, thing. Why? Because in 2006, when it was passed, and this is part of the story of Section 5 that, that people don't always hear, when it was reauthorized in 2006, who led the charge to reauthorize it? Walmart. Walmart lobbied the business roundtable. The business roundtable took a position, spent money lobbying Congress to pass the, the, the voting, the, the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. It passed the Senate 98 to zero. You hear that all the time. In the House, only 33 members voted against it. And if I, I tweeted the other day, the list of 33, it's who you would think. It's like Tom Tancredo and Steve King. It's people who were like crazy outside the mainstream of the Republican Party. Every other Republican voted for the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. Who signed that bill? George W. Bush signed the reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. So this was passed 98 to zero in the, in, the, in the Senate with only 33 no votes in the House and signed by a conservative Republican president. And now we get to, to, 20, uh, uh, to Shelby County in 2013 and you think, okay, this is a no brainer layup for reauthorization, but of course it doesn't. And in 2021, this year, it came before the House of Representatives and not a single Republican voted for reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act, not one. Now, for those of you out there who are, are, are not connecting the dots, choose your, your favorite moderate Republican congressperson. Adam Kinzinger voted against it. Liz Cheney voted against it. Name one. You know how I know they voted against it? Because they all voted against it. Not a single Republican would vote in favor of it. And in the ha in the Senate, it passed the House. In the Senate, we just had a vote where, where, where only Lisa Murkowski voted uh, uh, to support it, but it's being blocked by the filibuster. Peter, before you ask uh, another question, I'm going to ask Emily to give everybody instructions on how to pose a question in the chat room or uh, to pose a question unmiked. Emily? Sure, if you would like to put the question, please submit it in the Q&A function down at the bottom of your screen. Or if you would like to ask a question live, please raise your hand and I will unmute you. Peter, why don't you, uh, you ask a question? I actually have kind of a wrap up question then we'll go to Q&A. Okay, I don't wanna take up too much time here. One last question for you, uh, Mark. If you were the council to the Democratic majority up in Albany, as they sit down to redraw lines this next uh, first quarter next year, having, I think, pretty much been unhappy with what the Bipartisan Commission on Redistricting has come up with. What would be your, now this is advising Democrats who are in the majority, in light of what's going on around this country, how would you advise them? What would be your advice? And uh, uh, I won't, uh, well, I'm asking you to violate attorney-client privilege here. But, uh... <laughs> so here's what I would say. I would say that that um, the first thing to do is to figure out where you're going to put the pen. Because where you put the pen drives a lot of what the districts are. If you draw the districts by putting the pen on the tip of Long Island, you know, out in Montauk, is that as far as you get, Steve? That's, you can't go much further than that. Okay, and you draw the pen uh, east-west, then you wind up with a configuration of Long Island that is east-west. I'm sorry, that if, you, if you move it uh, west, you wind up with a configuration that is north-south. If instead you put the pen, you know, someplace in, I guess, Nassau County, I don't know where the, where the population would be, and you draw it uh, north-south, you wind up with a different configuration. So one of the things that I always say to anyone drawing a map is where you put the pen will drive a lot of what the districts look like. And one of the things about New York that, you know, and I, I'm a downstate person myself, 
um, but haven't gone to school in upstate New York, or as they like to say in the Utica Rome area, central New York. Um, uh, and since I'm talking to people uh, who have a uh, connection with Ithaca, I hope you appreciate this, is that too often the, the districting around New York, they always start with downstate. They always start with downstate. And it felt to me, you know, I remember in the, uh, uh, Steve, you're gonna have to remind me what year this was, but uh, I actually litigated the New York, the last New York map was uh, resolved in a federal court in Brooklyn. Um, and I was the lawyer for, for the Democratic congressional interests, essentially, in that, in that. And there was a district outside of Buffalo that Congressman Hochul, yep. then Congresswoman Hochul, helped. Yep. And I thought that, that that district was not fairly treated. The district was essentially obliterated because the judges who were drawing the map were sitting in a courtroom in Brooklyn. And they were, they were trying to figure out where Park Slope should go. And I would be like, well, but how about how about Buffalo? You know, how about how about Rochester? Um, and so, you know, what I would tell folks in any state, including New York, is make sure you are looking at the map holistically. Make sure that you are that you are not letting the biases of where you put the pen drive the map, so that the people of Buffalo, the people of Syracuse, the people of Utica, Rome, um, the people of Albany, uh, are not being treated fairly as well. All right, I'm going to hold my question until the end of our conversation. Uh, it relates to uh, your just a beautiful piece uh, that you did in Democracy Docket. But let's hold on that because I want to open it up to quite a few questions that we have. Uh, and so, Emily, would you please unmute our first questioner? Yes. First, we have Rep. Frost. He's unmuted. Congressman. How are you? How's the bookstore doing? It's doing okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the plug. All right, let me ask uh, my question. It's, I believe the new Texas congressional map is clearly a racial gerrymander, which the courts have been willing to strike down. It's not a political gerrymander. What are our chances in Texas federal courts this year in getting part of the map invalidated as we did 10 years ago? The courts 10 years ago ordered a new district in the Dallas-Fort Worth area that elected Mark Vesey, an African-American. Yeah, so great question. Um, and as I mentioned before, um, my, my career in politics really began with uh, Dick Gephardt, uh, David Bonier, and then Martin Frost, all sort of in one form or another taking me under their wing to uh, let me, uh, let me uh, unleash against, um, against uh, uh, the, uh, the, the then new uh, Republican majority in the House. Well, so you've done very well since then. <laughs> so it's good to it's good to talk to you. Um, just the definition of terms for for everyone. Um, so when you talk about a a uh, a partisan a, a political gerrymander, a racial gerrymander, rather, I'm sorry. When you talk about a racial gerrymander, what we're talking about is where districts are drawn using race as the predominant factor for moving a significant voters inside or outside of a district. So essentially, the district is being drawn where race is the predominant factor. Um, it is a claim that, as the congressman has pointed out, has actually fared relatively well before the Supreme Court. It was mentioned that I argued four cases in the Supreme Court last go around. All four of them were racial gerrymandering cases, and I won all four of them um, with some combination of liberal justices, but also Clarence Thomas was with me on a couple of cases. Chief Justice was with me on a couple of cases. It's, it's a doctrine that has fared better in the courts just in general than, than some of the others. So the question that the Congressman is asking is, it is you know, the, the, when you look at the Texas map, there are parts of it that look like a racial gerrymander and you know, what, are the pro what are the prospects there? Um, in full disclosure, I am among the lawyers suing the state of Texas over their congressional districts. Um, and um, I think that there are, that, that uh, Congressman is, is someone who knows Texas as well or better than anyone. Um, there are parts of the map that sure look like section two violations. There are section parts of the map that look like they may be uh, racial gerrymanders. Um, I think that the Texas legislature, interestingly, you're right, did not choose to say we were doing this for partisan reasons. Um, uh, and as a result, they, I think, are going to leave themselves open 
um, to successful litigation. Again, saying that as someone who is bringing litigation. Um, as, as you know, uh, Texas's maps have been the subject of successful litigation in the past. And the fact is the Republicans drew, notwithstanding the fact that, popu that population gains in that state for two rounds of redistricting now have primarily been on minority voting um, uh, growth. Um, we continue to see them uh, weaken uh, the ability of uh, minority candidates to elect their candidate of choice and to engage in racial gerrymandering. Well, my real question is the federal courts and of course the Fifth Circuit uh, has gotten very conservative and even federal district judges in Texas uh, uh, are some of them are very conservative and can we win in federal court in Texas today? Got it. Okay. Yeah. So look, here's the thing. You know, when I won the Virginia racial gerrymandering case, um, we actually did as well with conservative judges on the three judge panel. Um, I actually lost one of the liberal judges on the three judge panel because there is an element of the racial gerrymandering jurisprudence that, as you know, originated um, out of North Carolina in the Shaw cases, which was a conservative doctrine. So, you know, I don't want to get too much into the, the weeds on this, but the reason why I say that, that it's a doctrine that conservatives can latch onto is if they are principled and not just outcome oriented, that's a big if, but if they are there, you know, the notion of using race as the predominant factor to move lines, weave in and out of neighborhoods, you know, gives some conservative judges uh, 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 quiz, and that's why we were successful before a conservative Supreme Court. So I'm not, I, I'm, I'm relatively optimistic. Thank you, Congressman Frost. It's always wonderful to be with you. Um, Emily, I think we have a Cornell student ready to ask a question. Yes, next we have Cornell student Patrick Naylor. Patrick? Hi, Congressman, and hi, Mr. Elias. Thank you so much uh, for coming to speak. Oh, I think we lost him. Mm -hmm. Are we going to try and get him back? Yeah. There we go. He's back. Okay. How about now? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we're good. Yes. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, uh, Congressman Israel, and thank you so much, Mr. Elias. Uh, my question to you is, you know, last week we had our own elections in the state and voters actually turned down our referendum around same-day voter registration and allowing the legislator to also talk about no excuse, no excuse absentee voting. And so I guess my question to you is for sort of all those citizens and local leaders out there who might not be lawyers, specifically, how do we start to continue pressuring our state governments and our county legislators and our boards of elections to try and make voting a more fair process, especially for folks like up in, in upstate New York with more rural challenges? Yeah, look, I, you know, I said that I'm constantly being accused by Republicans of, number one, you only sue red states, why don't you sue blue states? Um, uh, and number two, I cherry, they say I cherry pick which laws I challenge. On the second, I've put out a standing offer. So I've got um, 300 people. Some of you have to be Republicans and some of you are probably Republican lawyers. You come up with a voting restriction that you think disenfranchises voters and I'll join with you. Like you don't like the ones, you don't like the restrictions I challenge. What restrictions on voting don't you like? And let's, let's work on a bipartisan basis to reduce barriers to voting for, for, for everybody. Um, but to your, to your question, um, I, I mentioned that I sue blue states because I'm actually suing New York. Like New York's got pretty regressive voting laws in many respects. New York's got a ban on food and water at the poll uh, uh, for people in line. And I'm suing them on behalf of the NAACP of Brooklyn. Um, so we can't be afraid and I shouldn't assume you're a Democrat, but you people who care about voting rights shouldn't be afraid of bringing pressure to bear on other people who are in favor of voting rights. You know, if if it, we have a we have a Democratic governor and we have a Democratic legislature in Albany, they should make making voting easier a priority. It should be at the top of their agenda. It should be at the top of Congress's agenda. It should be at the top of the agenda everywhere in America. And that's not just where Republicans control things, it's where Democrats control things. So, you know, that's one thing I'd say. The second is, it shows that we can't just assume that good things are gonna happen just because we're in blue states. 
Like how much energy was put behind passing those initiatives? How much education, how much money was spent? I suspect not much. And so we need to be aggressive in being pro-voter. It's not enough to just be against. We have to be pro-voter. We have to be voter-centric in our actions, in our litigation, in how we judge election officials, how we judge laws. And there's no like thumb on the scale. If, if, if people are restricted, if people, if there are bad voting laws, there are bad voting laws. Okay, next we have a question from the chat from Grace Chen. Are independent redistricting commissions a tangible solution to partisan gerrymandering? So it doesn't look like it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I understand the impulse. I have never been a huge, full disclosure, I've never been a big fan of independent redistricting commissions. That puts me out of the mainstream, certainly of progressives. Um, but part of it is because it, it feels like we are, we are, we are not, um, we are not solving for outcomes or solving for processes. And, um, you know, what we have seen this go around has proved that to be true. You know, the Virginia uh, bipartisan redistricting commission literally could not develop a map. Like it just, each side's map draw drew a map and they both failed. So now the Virginia courts will, will wind up drawing the map. I, I look at the, uh, the redistricting, um, uh, commission in states like Ohio, where it, where it is essentially uh, failed. Uh, Oregon, I believe that the redistricting commission didn't produce the map. I think the legislature passed the map. The Colorado map that came out of that redistricting commission, um, I don't know how you look at that map and say that that map is fair to Latinos. Um, you know, others may disagree with me there. The redistricting commission in Arizona isn't on the right track. I mean, that doesn't look like that's going to produce a particularly fair, fair map. The Michigan Redistricting Commission also looks like it's, it, it is struggling to come to a consensus. So the problem is that a process that relies on bipartisanship is a difficult process, which is why you have deadlock in the U.S. Congress. <laughs> so why do you think when you take that same process and you just put it around redistricting, it's going to make it any easier? So I'm not anti commissions per se, I'm not really pro. To me, the proof is in the maps. The proof is whether or not you're getting fair maps. Are you treating constituencies fair? Are you treating um, uh, populations and communities of interest fair? That's really should be the judge. And, and fixes that simply focus on the process and not on the what I call the criteria are not gonna get you there. We have about uh, seven minutes left, and uh, I, I see uh, in our chat room uh, a breath of fresh air, uh, a former Republican member of Congress, Tom Coleman, uh, who uh, has been outspoken in support of, of voting rights and justice, and uh, I'm going to ask Emily to unmute Congressman Coleman. I think I did. I think I am unmuted. Hey, Tom. Hi, Congressman. Oh, Mark, I want to say thank you for all the work that you do. Um, Tom, I was let's, let's, put it, let, let's put in perspective uh, so that people know your background. Just yeah. share for a moment uh, the district that you represented, your, your, the, your, your party, uh, the work yeah. that you did, and then ask the question. Uh, I, I served for 16 years in a district in Missouri that was, when it started, was two to one Democratic, and I was a Republican. It's now at least two to one Republican. Uh, that's how Missouri has changed over the years. I, uh, the Republican Party has significantly changed, and so I'm no longer considering myself a Republican. But I want to thank Mark for all of his work and efforts because we need people like this who are totally committed to making sure that we don't lose our democracy. So my question to Mark is, how confident are you that we're going to be able to have at the end of the day, at the end of this Congress, a, vo a Voting Rights Act passed and the Freedom to Vote Act passed into law because everybody gets excited about these policy things, infrastructure, whatever. It won't matter if we don't have our democracy and freedom to vote. So I hope you're confident. A Amen, Congressman. I mean, that's kind of what I say is that, you know, you can look back at any historical period and politicians and presidents will be remembered by their big achievements. And people are gonna look back at this historical moment and ask, what did you do when democracy was at stake? And they're gonna ask that of every, every person who is in any position of power. Um, and people who are not in position of power are gonna to have to explain what were they doing when this was all going on? 
Were they standing up? Were they speaking out or were they hiding? Were they focused on this or were they focused on other issues that are less important? So I understand there's lots of important issues facing the national leadership in the country and Congress and, the, um, uh, and in states, but preserving our democracy needs to be at the top of that list. I wish I could say I am confident that those two bills will pass, but you know as well as I do the odds that they face. You know, they will pass the House. Uh, they have passed the House. Uh, the Senate is more difficult because uh, though you have 50 votes for, uh, uh, for the people are now freedom to vote, uh, and you have 51 votes for the John Lewis bill, um, the filibuster is still in place and absent reform in the Senate around that issue, they won't pass. So, you know, that's just the, that's just the math of it. But I, but I want to say how important it is that so that you know someone with your background does speak out because the easy thing for a former republican member of congress to do is to not alienate their friends their supporters maybe their family and just to stay quiet and it's people like you who speak out that are the real heroes it's easy for me to speak out you know but but so thank you for 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 being willing to to step forward at, a, at this time in history you'll be remembered for it so thank you thank you mark thank you congressman uh, next question, Emily. Our next question is from Barry Cutler. Barry, you are unmuted. Barry, are you with us? Yeah. Is that better? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I have a few premises in my mind that I am not quite sure about, so I'm not going to be doctrinaire, but I would love Mark to straighten um, straighten them out for me and others. Uh, I do remember that there was a cluster of one man, one vote uh, cases in the early 60s. And the Supreme Court certainly took it very seriously. And I have in mind that in the last 12 or 18 months, there was a redistricting case in the Supreme Court and they refused to touch it because they thought it was a political issue. And that to me is very, um, it, it's hard to understand and may not even be right. And uh, along those lines, I was flabbergasted as a retired litigator uh, to see the Republicans go in on a couple of these cases and say, well, the reason we need to do this is for our preservation. I mean, I'm dumbfounded by that. Yeah. So uh, to the first question, um, the case you're thinking about is uh, Common Cause versus Rucho, which is the was the case that went before the U.S. Supreme Court on a partisan gerrymander. So I mentioned that uh, when Congressman Israel and I were were conspiring together, um, <laughs> I sued North Carolina, struck down their congressional map as a racial gerrymander. What Congressman Frost was referring to in Texas this go round, um, which was that two of the districts, the first and the twelfth, were drawn. To, with race as a predominant factor by the Republicans in order to disadvantage um, black voters. The Republican legislature then said, okay, we're gonna pass a new map, but it's not gonna be a racial gerrymander. We're going, to, um, uh, uh, dis we're going to draw as many Republican districts as we can. And I think the exact quote was that they drew an, a 12-2 a map, a 12-3 map because they couldn't find a way to draw a, um, uh, a, uh, a 13 2 map. So it was just a avowed, um, admitted, ex explicit um, partisan gerrymander. And that went to the US Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said that they were not going to weigh in on partisan gerrymanders because they found it to be a political question, that there was no um, judicially manageable standard, to use their phrase, to judge how much partisanship was too much, which is like, preposterous. I mean, the, the courts make up standards all the time. And by the way, several Supreme Courts have found judicially manageable standards for partisan gerrymandering. But be that as may, that is what the U.S. Supreme Court said. So that's the that's the case that um, you're referring to. The second one you're referring to is actually during oral argument in a case I was involved in, uh, Bernadette versus DNC, where, the, where Justice um, Comey Barrett, of all people, asked the Republicans, you know, they said, she said, so Democrats are saying that these restrictions on voting, which are aimed at uh, Latinos and Native Americans, 
that it disadvantages them because those voters can't vote and it may disadvantage their candidates. What is the RNC's interest? And the lawyer for the RNC said, well, politics is a zero sum game. So if those people do vote, it disadvantages the Republicans. And that's actually rather an extraordinary statement from a major, a major political party that, that essentially you are injured when people can vote because they may not vote for you. Well, um, I would like to uh, reserve the right of the chair to uh, pose this final question to Mark. And it's, uh, I'm going to uh, read from, uh, from his article and then I'm going to properly thank the uh, Mark Joseph family and, and Mark himself uh, for this session. Mark, um, you write in a November 8th piece in Democracy Docket, five years later, you write about five years after Hillary Clinton lost uh, her election and Donald Trump won. And you write, near the end of her concession speech five years ago, Secretary Clinton offered those of us who had worked for her some direction for the future. Quote, this loss hurts, but please never stop believing that fighting for what's right is worth it. It is worth it. And so we need you to keep up these fights now and for the rest of your lives, unquote. After Secretary Clinton spoke, you write, I went back to the campaign headquarters and cleaned out my office and flew back to Washington, D.C. I was fortunate that I had a law practice and clients ready to tackle the 2018 elections. Others on the campaign were not as fortunate. Some found work on other campaigns and many left politics entirely. For months afterward, the secretary's words from that day haunted me. What did it mean in the age of Trump to continue fighting for what is right? How could I play a role in protecting and cherishing democracy and the peaceful transfer of power? The reason that I read this excerpt, Mark, is because we received so many questions from people saying, what can I do? Uh, one person wants to know whether you accept the volunteer lawyers to help in your efforts. Others, Cornell students saying, what can we do? So we hate to end these sessions on dour and pessimistic notes in a democracy that is really uh, fragile what can we all do to protect the basic right of our citizens to vote? How can we support your efforts? Yeah, so look, this is the biggest question I get, the most frequent question I get. And um, uh, we each have something we can do. I think the, the problem that I struggle with this question, where I came to it for myself, was that when we ask what can we do, in some sense, we are asking what are the big things we can do rather than asking what are the little things we can do. You know, some of us like you have big soapboxes, right? You can go on national television or you can, you can contact, you know, people who are in Congress and that's what you can do. And people want to know how can I do that? Um, but the truth is each of us play a role. And for some people that's going to be like me, you know, I litigate every day. I go to court, I, I fight for voting rights. For some people, it's gonna be speaking out. For some people, it's gonna be organizing and maybe organizing at the local level. You know, you all, you know, we saw in upstate New York um, in the district that actually spanned my former uh, college, uh, a congressional race that was decided by just a handful of votes. Mm. And so, each of you has something you can do. So I'm going, to, I'm going to start with something that is both the easiest thing to do and the hardest, which is speak out. Everyone has a megaphone. Some people's megaphone is MSNBC or CNN or the New York Times. But for each of you, you have a megaphone. It may be your Facebook friends. It may be your college roommates. It may be your dinner table. It may be your relatives who voted for Donald Trump. Or on the other side of the aisle, it may be your relatives who voted for Joe Biden. Each of you has the megaphone to make a difference by speaking out and not letting it be okay. You know, Desmond Mead, uh, who ran the voter, voting rights restoration effort for the ballot issue in Florida, had to get 60% of the vote in Florida to have uh, formerly incarcerated individuals have their rights restored in Florida on a ballot initiative. And the way he did it is by empowering every person to talk to their friends and their neighbors and say, our community will be stronger if we all participate. And each of you can talk to people in your circle, your Facebook friends, your Twitter, your, your, your dinner table and say, we can all be stronger if we all participate. 
And voting rights and democracy is the heart of that. Like, why wouldn't you want a community in which everyone participates? So it's not doing the grand thing, sure, calling members of Congress makes a difference. I think you'd agree that even Democratic members of Congress like to get calls, you know, supporting what they're doing. All that's important, but, but in some ways it lets you off the hook. So I'm going to give you this challenge to everyone here. The next time one of your coworkers or your customers or your clients or your friends or your family says something that is anti-democratic, that is against the inclusion of everyone in our democracy. Speak up to them, speak up to that person. Because if we all do that and we don't allow there to, for it to be acceptable to exclude people from our democracy, we'll make a difference. So that's what people can do. You can also, by the way, go to democracynugget.com and subscribe, it's free, it's a free subscription. So uh, you can get all of my writings uh, there. For anyone, who is interested uh, in the preservation of democracy and, and voting rights and wants to understand how that is being fought in those trenches, you must subscribe to Democracy Docket. I do, it is phenomenal. It will inform you uh, very, very deeply. Uh, Joseph, thank you and your family uh, for your leadership and your activism and for choosing this topic uh, to uh, to hope uh, with us like Peter uh, and fighters like in the Cornell community, whether you're a Republican or Democrat, doesn't matter. We will prevail. Thank you all very much, and we event. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Thank you very very much. Thank, Thank you so you. much.